Good morning, everyone. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to give this talk today. We are going to start the day with a medical perspective on real world data. This is the overview of my presentation and let's start with a definition of real world data and real world studies. According to FDA, real world data are the data relating to patient health status and or the delivery of healthcare routinely collected from a variety of sources. And EMA uses the same words, but in the end adds other than traditional clinical trials. And to put it even more simply, real world data is observational data in which participants do not have to follow a specific protocol. And when I say specific protocol, I mean an externally imposed protocol by the researchers and not the protocols that may be followed in certain hospitals. Real world evidence is the clinical evidence derived from the analysis of real world data. So is this new to medicine? The terms are relatively new, but the actual studies are not. And we ha I have put here two prime examples, the tuberculosis registry in the United Kingdom and the National Leprosy Registry uh, of Norway, uh, that both have started to collect the data more than 100 years ago, and they meet all the definitions of real world data. Another important question is, is, is this one, are all real world studies the same? And the simple answer is no, because real world studies is an umbrella term that includes studies of different design, different with different sources of data and different types of data. And started, starting with a design, we can have cohort studies and in these studies, these studies are usually prospective studies and we have an exposed and an unexposed population and we are following this, the participants in time to see if they're going to develop an outcome or not. But we can also have case control studies that are way more frequent in real world studies where we go retrospectively and we see the proportion of patients with an exposure that uh, develop the outcome or not. And those are just two examples. We can also have cross-sectional studies, ecological studies, correlation studies, or even case series. The sources of data can be also different in real world studies. And we can have data from healthcare databases, electronic health records, disease or patient registries, medical claims and billing data. We can gather data from mobile devices and wearables. We can conduct surveys and collect data. We can also include data from biobanks, or we can even have data from social media. The types of data can also be different, and we can have primary data. Those are data uh, collected uh, firsthand. So we have a hypothesis, and we want to test this hypothesis, and we go on and collect the data uh, to test our hypothesis, but we can also use secondary data, data that have been collected for a different purpose, let's say to answer a different research question, and now we are using the data to answer a new research, research question. And of course, these two types are very different. And now that we have said a few words about the definitions, let's move on on the value of real world data and real world studies. The holy grail in medicine is randomization. Ideally, we randomize patients in two or more arms. And by, by doing this, we are controlling for unknown confounders and we can test our hypothesis. But the truth is that we cannot conduct a clinical trial for every research question. And we cannot do that because first of all, clinical trials are expensive. Uh, even if we do, we, we will have to put some eligibility criteria so we will end up with selected populations. Usually they have a short follow-up. Yes, we can conduct clinical trial with a very long follow-up, but this will make the trial even more expensive. Sometimes they're impractical and a good example is rare diseases and conditions. And finally, they can also be unsuitable or even unethical. So where can we use real world data? Great, they can help in pharmacovigilance. They're the only way to conduct health economic studies. They're great to assess long-term outcomes. They can assist the design of clinical trials. And they can also assist the conduct of clinical trials by creating synthetic control arms. 
we can use them to uh, assess patterns, practices, and adherence to medications, and also to collect patient reported outcomes and patient experiences. I didn't mention anything about efficacy and effectiveness because ideally the best way to assess efficacy of a therapy, of an intervention, is to conduct a randomized control trial. But as I said earlier, sometimes this is not possible and, and we can use real-world studies even for effectiveness in the case of uh, real-world uh, studies. And this is a great example. Recently, FDA approved tacrolimus, an immunosuppressant for lung transplant recipients based on an observational study, on real-world study. And this proves uh, the potential of uh, this type of studies when conducted the right way. So I, I hope that I, that I convinced you about the value of real-world studies. But in these types of studies, we also face many challenges. And I will start with the terminology and reporting. We need to have a common terminology to say and mean the same things. And there are great efforts that are trying to do that to um, harmonize the terminology in real-world uh, studies. And we also need to have a common way of reporting these studies, and the Strode criteria uh, are uh, an excellent way to do that. And we also have specialty-specific uh, guidance, and uh, I have here the one for oncology by ESB. Another very important thing in real-world studies that is a great challenge is collecting data of high quality. And this is probably the most important step because no matter how sophisticated methods we're using to uh, analyze our data, if we don't have data of high quality, then it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. And we have many ways to assess the quality of our, of our data. And I won't go through each one, each one of them in detail, but the important thing is to put the effort uh, to collect data the right way to curate the data in order to end up with data of high quality. But even if we have data of high quality, in these studies we need uh, many participants, we, we, we need uh, uh, large studies in order to reach meaningful conclusions, and in order to do that we need to collaborate with different researchers from different countries or even different continents, and in order to do that Many times we need to combine different data sets. And uh, this is not always easy, but uh, hopefully we have the efforts that are trying to do that. To try, they are trying to create common data models. And I'm sure that most of you are familiar with Odyssey, but there are also others that are doing this uh, uh, job. And this is very important in order to uh, maximize the potential of real world data. But even if we have the data in a common uh, format and we have data of high quality, we need to share data uh, in order to analyze them. And we are always in these studies collecting sensitive data and we have to define who is the owner of the data and we have to meet complex and country specific regulations in order to share the data. But if we cannot do that, we can use uh, other techniques, privacy preserving techniques, uh, techniques, and federate analysis is a great example of that. And just to briefly explain what is a federate analysis, let's say that we have two local databases and we want to combine the data in a central database. This is the traditional way. The, the local database sends the data uh, in uh, the central database and they're combined here and analyzed. And this is the traditional way. In federate analysis, the central database sends questions to the local databases and the local databases send back answers and raw, not raw data. And this is a privacy preserving technique. Uh, and it's a very useful way to conduct a study if we cannot meet the legal requirements of data sharing. Moving on, another challenge is the complexity of novel approaches. And you can see here the steep rise of studies using artificial intelligence in medicine in the last few years. But the most important question is, do physicians really understand these complex approaches? And it's very important to train physicians to understand these uh, approaches because first, as researchers, they need to be part of the design in order to ensure the best use of these technologies. But even more importantly, 
as clinicians, they need to understand these approaches in order to trust them and implement the research findings. Because if we don't have this last step, then all these uh, studies are essentially useless. And I will finish the presentation by saying, uh, saying a few words about the role of physicians. And I will start with, uh, met uh, with methodology. As physicians, we need to set realistic research questions, and this is, should not be a given. We should be able to assess the fitness for use of uh, our data. And what I mean by that is that we should be able to say that our data can answer these questions, questions but they cannot answer another question. We, we should predefine the research, research questions and analysis plan. The worst case scenario is to collect data and then just uh, analyze, them, analyze them, them in order to find random correlations. And finally, we should be able to recognize the limitations of the data set and minimize potential bias. Another important uh, role of the physicians is in evaluating the results of a real world study. And I'm sure that you are all familiar with this pyramid that says that the highest level of evidence comes from the meta-analysis of, of randomized controlled trials. Then we have randomized controlled trials, non-randomized controlled uh, trials, and then we have observational studies. But here we have many different layers of quality. And we need to be able to assess the quality of real world study. And I mentioned uh, how important is the data quality of a real world study. But another important thing is that when authors report a correlation, to be able to assess if there is a true causal relationship between the finding uh, in, and not just a, a random correlation. And just to briefly ex uh, explain what is a what is causal relationship, let's say that we have a man that uh, uh, notices that when he sleeps with his shoes, he wakes up with headaches. So we have a correlation between the shoes and the headaches. But the true causal relationship is between the alcohol that this man drank uh, the previous night and the headache. And also there is a causal relationship between the alcohol and the shoes, but they, there is not a causal relationship between the shoes and the headaches. And how can we assess causal relationship? A great way to do that is to use the nine criteria of Brantford Hill. And those are to assess the effect size of a, of a finding to see if it is consistent. So does anyone, did anyone else find the same thing? It should be specific. To, so we don't have another explanation for this finding. Temporality is important. The effect has to occur after the cause. Biological gradients, uh, e gradient is a plus if, the, if we have a dose response relationship between uh, the, if the cause and the effect. Theoretical plausibility, do we have a mechanism that can explain this finding? Coherence, if we have a hypothesis and then we, are, we collect the data and prove the hypothesis, that is also a plus. Experimental evidence, not always uh, uh, easy to do that, but if we have it, great. And finally, analogy. Did anyone else in a different field prove the same thing? That's also a plus. And just to give you two simple examples, we all know that smoking is a risk factor for lung cancer, but we don't have any randomized control trial that, uh, ha that has proved that, but rather we have many observational studies with a large effect size, with a clear mechanism and, the, uh, and uh, a clear hypothesis in many of these studies. And the number of studies is, uh, uh, is very large that, uh, how, and all of these studies have found the same thing. And we also have biological gradients. So if you, uh, people that are smoking, uh, that uh, are more heavy, that are heavy smokers have a higher risk of lung cancer. Uh, so we are, uh, the, this finding meets most of uh, uh, brand for Hills criteria. So another example that uh, I would like to show you is this study that I was lucky enough to be part of. This study was conducted by the European Research Initiative on CLL. And in this study, we collected data on almost 20,000 patients with CLL. 
and we try to assess the risk factors for the occurrence of, an, of other malignancies in patients with CLL. So all patients had this hematological uh, malignancy CLL and we assessed the risk factors for the occurrence of a second, uh, other, uh, for second malignancy. And I'm showing you here in the table a specific finding where we um, found that a specific chemotherapy given for chronic lymphocytic leukemia was associated with the occurrence of an acute leukemia. And if we assess the Branford Hills criteria, we will see that we have a large effect size. We have consistency because others have found the same things, uh, the same thing in smaller cohorts. We couldn't think of another explanation. So we had specificity. We also have the morality. First, well, the, these the patients received chemo, the chemotherapy for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and then they developed acute uh, leukemia. We had a clear mechanism. These drugs are cytotoxic. They are causing damage to the DNA, and, can, and this can cause acute leukemias. We, we had coherence. This was a hypothesis uh, before uh, we conducted the study. And we also had analogy because uh, this find uh, uh, others have found the same thing in solid tumors where uh, chemotherapeutics can uh, cause acute leukemias. So to sum up, the air world studies is an essential component of medical research. Ensuring quality of the data is the most important step in conducting a real world study. We have exciting new technologies but uh, we also have many challenges to overcome to contact uh, real world studies and we shouldn't forget that uh, we should train physicians to understand the basics of these te new technologies in order to ensure their best use and before finishing i would like to thank all my colleagues here in the institute in the european research initiative on cll but also in necrin and in grecting thank you for your attention Thank you, Thomas. Um, I think we're going to have all the questions and discussion afterwards. So um, I think we can also move to the next talk. I will stop doing this. So it's my distinct pleasure to invite to the podium um, Professor Timo <laughs> from the University of Köln. Um, vast expertise in the use of digital um, health and artificial intelligence for clinical trials. And to see your Thank you very much. Thanks to, for giving me the opportunity to talk about digital solution, one of my favorite things. And um, so digital solutions are not new in, in clinical trials, of course. And I will not talk about the standard uh, technologies and methods which we already have and which are established and which are uh, usual to our daily routines in clinical trials and inventing new ideas in our clinical trials. And I'm sorry if that seems my, the font, which I use is not here installed on the computer. Therefore it looks a little bit, not so nice on the top. Uh, so, uh, the, um, inventing new trials started long years back. So the first virtual clinical trials are started in 1998. In the next 10 years, there came internet-based, sightless, online, direct-to-patient clinical trials. So all these things are already developed uh, years back. And in the last decades, there came the web-based, patient-centric, remote, decentralized, digital, remote, decentralized. And the last idea of uh, making a new kind of clinical trial is a decentralized virtual clinical trial. So all these things are not new. But what, what I want to focus today is on new and innovative things. And I would like to bring you one thing into mind uh, when we talk about innovations is about what we expect, what that innovation is able to bring. So let's say we have a new level of realistic um, expectations for some new innovation. And here's, oh, the point is also completely missing. Um, so, um, it should show smiles here. <laughs> so, and then it, well, some of the smiles are there. Um, 
normally what we see in the so-called Gartner hype cycle is that we get an um, inflate expectation. So the, the expectation of some new development which we are facing is much more higher than a uh, new thing can really uh, fulfill. And that level is currently at ChatGPT. So with ChatGPT, we think we can do anything. What happens afterwards is that we get with that we convert into the opposite. So we think so it's useless at all, and, and we can't use it in any purpose. And normally that is a point where innovative uh, idea crashes and fails uh, in the market. But then after some period, it came back and stabilized to a more realistic, the so-called plateau of productivity. So what I want to tell you, when I'm, when I'm talking about innovative ideas, there's a lot of opportunities, but we have to keep in mind that a new idea uh, might be, have come with inflate expectation in the beginning, and we try, have to try to be realistic what new things can really do. Therefore, let's talk about artificial intelligence, and I would like to give you some ideas and inspirations. So it's not my intention to give you a full overview today, but just to give you inspiration that we can discuss afterwards together uh, about what can be done uh, with new digital solutions. One of the most early steps, of course, is a preclinic. And preclinic means you have to develop new drugs, new substance, new compounds uh, for clinical for, for to use in clinical trials. And one very interesting publication just uh, published this year in Science is about Robocam. Robocam is a fully automated AI driven synthesis lab where you just define what you expect to be synthesized. And the system itself makes a preparation, makes a synthesis pro process, has its own uh, uh, analyzed um, unit, and then can reinvent the way of synthesis and then improve itself. This system is much more faster than classical development by chemical expert. The reason is mainly because the system learns from failures. Whereas uh, if you're studying what is published, you only see the success of something. You, don't, it can you can't read about all the failures of the other colleagues doing while they're doing a synthesis process. Another thing is uh, unsupervised learning, uh, which is also in the field of artificial intelligence, means you can, for example, use it to identify the new clusters. That's an example of a large group of uh, gene variations in acute myeloid leukemia. And they used uh, unsupervised learning to identify new uh, clusters, which can be possible targets then. We heard in our present in the first presentation that there is once a while the challenge that we cannot centralize the data because some data privacy issues are there and you cannot just upload them. And we heard one um, um, so we heard that there's one solution um, to do a research in a decentralized way. Another opportunity is of course to institute Synthetic data. Synthetic data means you have a real set of data and you train an AI to develop uh, patient records. So, one way to overcome the data privacy uh, issue is to use synthetic data, which means uh, you train an AI to create simulated patient records which have identical uh, characters compared to the original patient, but not containing real patient data. Here's an example from an MDS uh, group of patients. You can see in blue, uh, the analysis made from the real data. And in red, there are the uh, results from the synthetic data. So you can really do analysis. You can use statistical software, whatever, uh, with these synthetic data, but they're not longer real patients and you have no data privacy issue. When it comes to trial preparation, there are also more and more tools in uh, using AI to, um, to help you to assist to develop a trial and to develop a trial contract. 
there are a lot of steps uh, to, before you start a trial um, where now new technologies are available. First of all, you can use AI to um, look for a suitable uh, patient cohorts. You all know the situation, maybe how to fit, how to use the best inclusion exclusion criteria and uh, such things can be now done today by AI. You can use AI technologies for patient recruitment in different steps, also patient empowerment. Uh, you can use it for adherence, endpoint detection. You can uh, use it for uh, the use use full monitoring, monitoring process and also to, to, uh, for the retention. Um, uh, here's a very interesting uh, report published end of last year from McKinsey, and they were talking about what can we do done for in artificial intelligence in clinical development, and that's the situation uh, it describing where you can simulate uh, changing of inclusion exclusion criteria to optimize the cohort of patients to have uh, the best effect and also the uh, positive cost effect on your trial. And then, of course, if you have to prepare a clinical trial, you have to write a lot of documents. And writing these documents also means that you have to be compliant with a lot of guidelines, regulations, and you have to fulfill all these things. Most of these things are standard work. And um, so standard work is perfect for a computer. Means uh, here is an example for a system, for an AI system, which works on top of JetGPT and it can write you an institutional review board. So the uh, study protocol, at least the trial. Only thing what you have to do is you have to define your hypothesis, you have to define your inclusion criteria, your exclusion criteria, and you have to define your study design. And then you put everything into the system and it gives you a draft, and then it's up to you to let do, let's say, your last 10 to 20%. That's an open source solution, so everybody who wants to use it can, can download for free and, and just work with that. We already heard about uh, real-world data before uh, using wearable self-tracker, and that's also something we should take in mind. Bring your own device is a, is a headline, which means uh, we most of us are wearing some devices, smartphones, uh, watches, which can track a lot of things. And um, these data are more or less uh, comparable. So, um, Bring your own devices can can be an opportunity to make uh, the um, activation process for a patient even faster and easier because he's already familiar with the device he's he's using. But of course, there's a lot of issues. Also, one of the thing is that these devices are normally linked to a cloud system which is based in US. So you have to connect via the backbone system in US to get the data, which of course can create some data privacy uh, issue. And um, most of the data which these wearables are collecting are not uh, primary measured data, they are interpreted by the algorithm, which means the algorithm interpretation might be different between different devices, and therefore the data might be comparable but um, in some cases, they might come to different results and that might affect the setting or the, the uh, purpose which you are, want to have in the trial. Trial access is also something where you can use um, modern technology and also with equity. <clears throat> I would like to give you one example we are currently working out, uh, on. We have a digital solution called ProReact. And we just completed last year a clinical trial, a large one in, in Germany, where we were able to show that ProReact is able to improve the quality of life, reduce serious adverse events, and uh, increase dose density in advanced breast cancer patients. But it was done in more than 70 uh, centers in Germany. So all of them were certified county centers, which is maybe a different situation to a country like Mozambique where we try now to implement and see what is possible. <clears throat> and we have different challenges in countries like Mozambique. First of all, here is the rate of usage of internet on the right side divided by countries. Um, and you can see the um, 
the blue dot, there are the younger people and the red dot are the elderly people. And you can see there's a difference between these both in Germany, which is far below, uh, down. Um, there we have a good uh, usage in both age groups. In Greece, there's a very good usage in the younger populations, slightly behind in, in the elderly. But Mozambique is somewhere comparable to Tanzania, which is there on the top. So uh, nearly no of the people in uh, Tanzania are using smartphones or internet at all. So they don't have access. And therefore, we were very happy to do that uh, trial together with Watercom, uh, which is providing the internet access and the devices, and together with the ABC Global Alliance. There's a new GXP coming up and getting more and more important, which is a good participatory practice, which means we should think about beyond just the people who are involved in the trial activity, actively. So not only communicating with the trial participants, we should think about larger layers like the community. So the people who are surrounding the patients or even look to broader stakeholders like uh, other organizations which are locally or going to the national level or to the even global level and including here social media in the communication also while the trial is going on that's something we've been trying to incorporate in a in a currently ongoing trial which is called cinderella this one is a trial for uh, breast cancer surgery and um, where we trying to, to meet all these levels and to communicate with as much uh, people as possible. Follow-up is something where we can also think about uh, using new technology and new applications. And here also I would like to refer to the trial Cinderella, where we have included patient app into the process. Cinderella trial is include enrolling uh, more than 1,000 patients undergoing breast cancer surgery. It takes place in five different countries. And one of the intentions within the trial is that the patient after surgery should take pictures or, or that the centers should take pictures for in total 12 months for the aesthetic outcome. For this purpose, all the centers have these foot robots which are on the left top side. These are large cabins where the patients are put inside, they got rotated by the system, and the system automatically makes pictures from different angels. But the challenge which we're facing here was that in some of the countries, the patients do not have contact to the center uh, where they uh, underwent surgery for such a long time. So these centers do not have the ability to take the pictures and to bring them into the uh, trial uh, database which is these pictures are part of secondary endpoint. And what we did therefore is uh, to use a smartphone from the patients, allow themselves to make pictures from themselves and then upload it to the system so that we overcome the situation that uh, patients contact get lost to the primary center. So as I said before, I just want to give you an, a brief overview and some feelings what can be done by technology. We talked about preclinic. There are different ways of AI for drug centers identifying new targets. Synthetic data is one very important thing. We can use it for trial preparation, AI for cohort comp composition, for patient recruitment, and patient monitoring, writing standardized documents. We talked about bring your own device as a new opportunity to get raw data or real world data, and also trial accessibility and follow up are things where um, new technology can be used. Thank you all, and looking forward for the discussion. At this point, I'd like, I'd like to ask both of you, uh, as you to move to the panel, and then actually go to the discussion. So, Thomas, you mentioned that the repositories were created to facilitate the sharing of clinical studies. Does the shared data have patient level information? And what about GDPR? Yes, uh, when collecting clinical data, we are always collecting sensitive data. Uh, we are collecting data from patients. If we don't store the data, we have to have sensitive data. 
So what I mentioned about federated analysis is just avoiding that. And, uh, it's, it's a way in which uh, the central database is extended in ways to change. So uh, what we are getting uh, as, uh, let's say, data is a grouped uh, information. We don't have uh, a, a data on the basic level. And this, can, uh, in this case, we don't need to apply the rules because we are getting uh, we're getting the, a sample of the data and not basic level data. Brian, something that is um, giving a very strong signal about a potential benefit, particular benefit or particular harm to a group of patients. So you would like to go back to patient costas. You don't know about costas in your aggregate data. Are there ways to do that? Yes. Uh, I mean, to if you depending on what you want to do as an analysis in order to do that. But uh, if you want to, um, to, let's say to to run more complicated analysis, you may have to go back and get uh, the, the raw data in order to do that. Yes. Timo. Yeah. So I just want to uh, tell one thing which is now new in Germany. Uh, we have a new law since one month uh, about. Uh, Health Data Reuse uh, uh, Act, which means uh, that by default, all patients' data are centralized collected in a pseudonymized way, and the patient has only an opt-out. I guess we heard, you'll hear something tomorrow yes, about that. Um, later but that's exactly uh, reflecting the point. And, and here, Gami, your question, see it's data pseudonymized, and if you see something suspicious, you can contact the health insurance and they have the right to re-identify the patient. Okay. So this, what do you think about moving to the polling questions? There we are. I think this is kind of the first question. So if you want to go to the- Please go to Slido. Slido. You'll see, you'll be able to see this kind of question now. So when you read an article reporting a real world study, which of the following information regarding data collection is the most important and should not be missing. Report, the, the physician should report the specific type and purpose of real world data source used. The physicians should provide details and timings of source and study man, data management. The physicians should explain why the source was considered appropriate for the study objectives the physician should provide core details on database governance, ownership, metadata, and full data accessibility. And of course, you're allowed to say, I do not know. So please vote starting now, and you have 15 seconds for doing that. And be prepared to justify your vote. Only 22 of you are now 27 and counting, but uh, you have five more seconds. Are you satisfied with 41 voters? 44 now. 44, okay, okay. let's close it. Uh, we trust that you will be more active in the second question and let's see how you voted. So, You have a clear winner that physicians should provide details and timings of source and study data management. And then you have as a second choice that they should explain why the source was considered appropriate for the study objectives. Now, would one from the majority here in the room like to identify yourselves? Don't be shy. Yes. Yes, I, I think this this is point is very important, but uh, another point is missing here, and that is, I think, the the main. Yes, it was yeah, but uh, it was the second best for me. Um, what is very important in observational studies, and that's similar to to randomized trials. You, you have to apply certain standards 
And one standard is you must have a research question. You must have a real objective. You must have a plan. Yeah, but you, the issue is we talk about data and real world data and an observational study are two different things. An observational study is a study with all the components, not randomization, but hypothesis. It should have a registration. It should have a reporting standard and so on. So it, it's, it's very similar in many aspects. And, and often it's not clear what was the hypothesis when people started. So the question here is, is when you wrote the report, what is more important for you? And you pick the first thing. So anyone voting for the first research paper? Anyone else? By the way, Thomas, what did you vote? I, I, I vote the first one, the, the, the majority. Timo? My smartphone is in front of you. Ah, okay. <laughs> what would you vote? Um, yes, I'll say with, with my majority. Why? Um, <clears throat> it's, it's very good to have the information to, uh, to understand if the data are reliable. And that gives a clear feeling if data are reliable. Okay. Should we move on? I think that's the next one. Yeah, so that's the second. Now, could you trust the results of a real world study about the effectiveness of a given treatment? And your options are yes, but only if it is confirming the findings of a randomized control trial. Yes. If I was convinced that the investigators collected data of high quality and addressed as best as possible potential sources of bias in data collection and analysis. No, efficacy can be proven only in a randomized control trial. Other, or I do not know. Let's see the results, Scottis. Ooh. Now, 10 of you, or less than that, said no efficacy can only be proven in a randomized control trial. So, is there any of you in this room who would be strong enough and confident enough and would like to say, yes, I believe it because of this? <laughs> yes. So, Timo. Yes, if it confirms a final randomized control trial, that I do, would do agree, and that's what we're doing in the phase four trials. Uh, so uh, we are confirming the findings of the phase three trial by doing phase four, which are uh, once a while just real world uh, studies or non-interventional studies. Y yes, but what about this new concept that was also included in a statement by both the FDA and the AMA about prospectively, uh, prospective plan, uh, prospectively carefully planned real world studies. Difficult, and I think it can't be generalized. If I take your examples, let's say I, I takes, uh, take somebody who assists and takes off the shoes in the evening. Perfect. You want to go? Yeah, I mean, I, I also uh, voted for, um, you know, we need a randomized control trial. The question is a little bit uh, awkward because there are so many options in this question. You can't answer everything. But for example, the situation you have a new CAR T treatment, you have a new product, which has first in men, for example, which has never been used in men, then you barely can try this in a real world data because there are no real world data available. So in some instances, you definitely need your uh, randomized clinical trial. You may can plan a given trial, maybe with synthetic data, etc., to come to a hypothesis and then prove this in the interventional trial. But I think um, effectiveness, you need to have a comparison. 
I would say that the all answers are right in a way. <laughs> of course, the the best thing is to conduct a randomized control trial. But uh, the, another question is that uh, if we don't have that, and if it is uh, almost impossible to do it in certain circumstances, I mean, you have to go with the first one because maybe it's worse to to, to not act, to not do anything because we don't have we, we, you won't you won't be ever able to conduct a, a randomized control trial. But of course, if you can do that, you should do that, and this is the best way. The, the, the third one, yes, but only if it is confirmed with the findings, it's of course an obvious uh, right answer. You are not doing it. Now, some of you have already brought up the issue, including you, of course, Timor, of synthetic data. And there is a question from our online viewers. How do we ensure that synthetic data for clinical studies are representative? And what steps are taken into gain regulatory, gaining regulatory approval for their use in research? So, synthetic data have a lot of opportunity, but um, we should not uh, ignore that if you generate synthetic data, you uh, generate them with a specific purpose and a special, special focus uh, in your data generation. And you have to be very uh, serious about what was the purpose of generation of these data. And you have to compare, as I showed in the slides, your synthetic data with your original source of data to see if they really are in the right direction. And of course, it can happen that they lead you in the wrong direction if you gen make new kind of analyze which you didn't do before with the original data. So there's a, let's say, a bivalent situation. Um, it's a new thing and uh, we can, I think we should start working with these uh, things, but it, they are not on the way right now to replace real data. Thank you. Dear co-chair, you are very active in the field. So any dissenting views or ideas? For synthetic data, um, not in that regard, but I, I would pose the question of how can you trust the software that produces the synthetic data? Or if it's AI generated data, how can you trust or make sure that the model underlying the synthetic data actually does the intended job? Because generating a data set and controlling against a realistic one that is sort of providing the same structure is one mechanism, but it's definitely not foolproof, as you were very well indicated. Um, so if I want to follow up on a question, if, if I may, in that direction, um, what would potential ways of assessing synthetic data and their suitability in, in, uh, in such, 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 such trial? Because structure is definitely one case, but how, what are possible other mechanisms? Thank you, and on to you for the next question. All right. Next one. Yes, that's the one. Right. So um, we've already heard uh, a couple of times already about AI. So it's definitely being tested and used. Um, but there are definitely challenges that are emerging, identified, or sort of lurking in the back of our heads. So there are some options here, and I'm just trying to figure out what you feel is the most sort of clear challenge uh, using AI. So the first one is sort of established lack of established and community-led community standards, uh, guidelines, recommendations. In other words, best practices that a particular community, like the clinical trials one, uh, clinical research one, says that these are the best ones. The second is the technical infrastructure. You cannot run AI if you don't have the infrastructure and expertise to do so. And the other one is the, the, the one that I just mentioned about trust of the AI models, the AI approaches, and finally, um, if you want to go top down, um, lack of regulatory frameworks. And of course, there's also the option I don't know. Just so now we will certainly have someone in the room to have voted for one of the top three options. And may I start moving around and asking volunteers? What did you vote? 
I don't know where to start. What did I vote or what would I like to vote? <laughs> because I would like to have three options. <laughs> so yeah, I, actually I, I, I voted that um, I have the feeling that we definitely miss regulatory framework, maybe more details in the regulatory framework. However, being honest, I was, uh, you know, balancing between lack of uh, um, community-driven guidelines and recommendations as well. So I have the feeling that we we need uh, to, um, we have a lot, a lot of things to do still in several different uh, areas. Both. <laughs> Yes. Other views, please. Yes. Yeah, I mean, when I when I look at the at the proposed answers, uh, the first uh, reaction I had was, what is the purpose? If it is for exploratory, then I would say the lack of uh, committee driven guidelines is probably one because you you do need to ensure that what you are producing is acceptable by your peers that will review your work. Actually, but if you are going for uh, key decisions on healthcare levels or drug developments, then the regulatory is lacking actually. But it comes also with um, the models. What are the models that are viable out there? Have then been validated, yes or no, by whom, and for what purpose? So I think I mean artificial intelligence uh, covers um, uh, different domains and different expertise, and um, and I think. The first one, I think I would agree with the first line there. I mean, the community of scientists and researchers should develop the guidelines and the consensus around how to analyze them and what are the acceptable um, you know, uh, methods to generate the, the evidence behind it. Hello, good morning. Um, I voted for lack of trust. Um, and I do feel that is the main, um, challenge that has to be met um all the others are regulatory and law and established decisions and, and that is difficult that might not be perfect but we'll get to that eventually the problem here and i'm speaking as a pure clinician now is that clinicians do not trust ie for two reasons for two reasons first um they don't know much about it uh so you you usually are not um willing to trust something you don't know and most of all it has been perceived as something that is going to replace you it's going to take your jobs it's going to make you dispensable so these are the two reasons why clinicians in in real world do not trust IE, and that i think is the most important challenge Perfect. But then may I ask you, okay, we understand and I share your point as a clinician uh, myself, but then what in your view would be the prerequisites for trustworthiness in AI? Um, I'm not sure I'm going to give you the answer that you're hoping for, because I think there's two ways to go. One is the easier way. That doesn't mean it's easy. And that is to establish clear guidelines, clear laws, clear regulations, and make the whole process open. That, I believe, it's the easiest one, even though it's not, it's still quite hard. The most difficult has to do with education and literacy, even in universities, so that physicians learn how to work with IE and not see it as, a, as a, an adversary. So you would say that we need to work hard to prepare the medical workforce for delivering digital healthcare. Yes. Christoph, I'm coming to you. I, I also voted for trust and uh, in, in a current project we are performing on in silico trials in cardiology, uh, we learned because we had contact with the regulatory bodies. And, and the first point was the validation. They were, they were not happy with the validation, with, with the number of cases used for validation, with the type of validation, it was, not, it was aggregated and so on. So they had no, really no trust in the validation. And the second argument was, was also um, 
regulatory body from the US, said, yeah, what, what you do in Europe may not be relevant in the States. So, so you must also have a validation for, for the application uh, area, country, uh, where you are. So, so, so you always have to, to, um, to validate with, with relevant real data. And I think this is, this is the main challenge. But before I come to you, Timo, we have industry representatives in the room. So, Tina, Dr. Andakopoulou is a medical director of Vabvi in Greece. Tina, what about I vote uh, for the lack of regulatory frameworks because especially in preclinical research, what we're doing is that we should have uh, data that would be accepted by the regulatory authorities so that we, uh, they are trustworthy and reliable to be submitted to the regulatory authorities in order to um, obtain the necessary approval to move on to clinical trials. So I think this is the most important roadblock yeah, for I think that uh, yes, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. I think that the well, the models need, we are just at the beginning of uh, using AI. So we, we don't have all the solutions there already. That's, that's what I think. So one minor comment, we have the framework for AI in clinical trials. It's already there. The Cinderella project, which I uh, demonstrated, that is an AI project uh, and it's use AI with a patient. So the regulations is there. But I guess the most important for me is lack of knowledge, lack of information. And that is really a very important thing. And uh, just a short uh, comment here, uh, the university where I'm active, it's not Cologne anymore, it's in Munich. Um, there we are currently preparing a master degree in medical information, specialized for physicians, that they can learn all the things uh, of how AI and all the things works. Yeah, I'm, I'm also from, um, from the industry and, um, and I think to, to put it in simple words, I think yeah, we should look at all those techniques for generating evidence with the right background that we have been using since decades right now, which is everything during the, the process should be qualified. Um, you mean up to now we are qualifying the individuals who are doing the job. You don't get into you know statistical analysis if you're not qualified for this job, and you have a full quality assurance, you know, a framework that demonstrate that all your processes, technologies that you use, all of those are qualified. And I think we need to find a way to qualify the EI components. The same way we've been qualifying other things. And the last point for that is transparency. I think black box AI is something that we should really fight against. And transparency in the EI should be established so that the experts could come out on it and say, yes, I can see now the model, I understand it, it's valid, I can use it. But transparency is the key word. And I will also back up the, the comments from others that education is also key. People, we need to educate the workforce about what is EI, what is not also. Yeah, yeah, quick, Nadia, I'm over from Sanofi. Uh, on that very thing, you mentioned also frameworks, and uh, uh, there is a question, Timo, you may answer that. You may want to answer that. Is the AI Act not a sufficient regulatory framework for the use of AI in research? Is the AI Act not a sufficient regulatory framework for the use of AI in research? So here we have to specify which kind of uh, research we are talking about. If it's preclinical research, it's fine. Uh, if it goes to clinical research, clinical trials, I think we need further regulations which specify more. So, sir. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, Cisco Liva. I am uh, the representative of uh, GSRI 
in uh, the AOM of uh, Clean Eric. And I am biologist by background, uh, working in the Hellenic Pasteur Institute. Uh, so I have to say that, uh, first of all, I voted for uh, the lack of established community-driven guidelines. And uh, I think that the question refers to the preclinical research, not the clinical research. No, pre is in brackets. So it refers to all the Ah, okay. In that case, it should be said as biomedical research or translation of research. Preclinical research is part of the spectrum. Yes. My comment is that in uh, what the biologists say as preclinical research, AI is. Uh, uh, the guidelines for, for community driven guidelines would be sufficient. We were doing a lot for this. We were instrumental in proposing, in setting up community driven guidelines. So, are you absolutely happy with the current status? I am, and I have to agree with most of the comments that have been raised. Um, but I also think these three points, these three responses are a bit connected. Um, in order to actually have effective regulation, we need to have already a baseline of a community accepted standard. Uh, in order to have a community accepted standard, you need to have a basic at least understanding of how all those things work. Um, so these are intertwined. And the example that Conscious mentioned about the, um, the, the elixir standard for machine learning, it is a standard for reporting on the machine learning. So it's not of the design, not on the framework. So it's more of a, how do you need, what information do you need to be aware of, of the model itself? So in that case, um, it kind of works because you bring the community together, you have a common understanding of what is the underlying process, and then you identify exactly which parts you really need to have information on in order to produce an effective assessment. This can be used then in top-down regulatory frameworks, which rely essentially on the input of scientists, researchers, and scientific communities to give this information first. So I'm very happy to start with the community-driven guidelines because this, I think, forms the base of pretty much everything then. Hi, everyone. Danny Peter Hambra from the University of Oxford. Um, as a clinician by background, uh, one of the challenges I, I find is also that we as as MDs or, or as prescribers of treatments or technologies need two things before we use them in, in clinical practice. One is very strong evidence of benefit better than harm and understanding how that technology works. Like I do not prescribe a medicine if I don't understand how that medicine works or, you know, and most of the times I think we lack both <laughs> in the use of AI. Understanding is very tricky, like clinicians are not trained in mathematics to the level required sometimes to understand AI. Um, and evidence is also not always there. Like, you know, we do not always have, you know, the, the kind of clinical trial data that you expect. Uh, so it's very hard to expect that clinicians will adopt these technologies knowing that they are going to be the ones who end up in, in court if they, you know, use that and then uh, end up causing harm or there is a perception that you've been causing harm. Uh, so I think those are the two reflections that uh, that are clearly lacking uh, for us clinicians to use AI extensively. Thank you, Danny. And Pandelis, you have a question for Timo. Please introduce Before, uh, yes, my name is Pandelis Natsiavos. Uh, I am a researcher. I am a researcher at the Institute of Applied Biosciences here at CERT. But before asking my question to Timo, I, I would like to express my surprise because I, I see that doctors insist on explainable AI. I had the impression, please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a doctor, that doctors regularly use medicine which they don't know how they actually work. They know that this medicine, these drugs work, they are effective and they prescribe it, even though they might not know how exactly they do work. Isn't this the case then? No? Very rarely. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, actually, my argument. Would like to give yeah. direct comments to that. Um, 
is your hematologist, your hematologist say, venomous time you're, you're using, yeah? It took 30 years after approval to understand at least somehow how it works. Actually, I have heard this argument from a doctor in a conference about explainable AI, uh, where he stood up and told us that, guys, I don't know how paracetamol works, and I give it for 40 years. So, uh, anyway, uh, going to my question, Timo, you, you mentioned uh, very nice applications of AI, mostly focusing on AI trial preparation and data processing after they are collected. I, I was wondering if you have any, any insights on, uh, or good examples about using AI to personalize the data collection process or, uh, or even the intervention per se because this is also a key issue, if you ask me, how we, how we could avoid unnecessary data collection from patients and uh, reduce their burden? That's a good question. Um, so, um, to be honest, uh, good examples uh, which are um, valid and have good clinical results are uh, not in my mind right now. Uh, as far as I know, most of the things are, let's say, in an early stage, and they are developing and, and going to that direction. And uh, let's say if we have a situation like with a big uh, CRO and the big CROs who are using such tools, it's more like a flash box because they are they keeping a, a secret in, inside their house, and they're not openly telling how they're optimizing. They're just using it and, and offer the service to the industry but uh, it's not that they speak openly about it. Now, Otis, the next question, please. Ready to, are you all ready to vote again? You heard about synthetic data. So the question now is, if you are thinking about the many roles of synthetic data that I might have in clinical research, what would be like the main role that you see? Um, I could easily imagine everyone say all of them, but like focus on what would be the primary focus. So the one is the benchmark of the process. There are a lot of computational in Silco or other processes in clinical research. Synthetic data can be used as a benchmark across those things. Second, you have a corpus of data that are synthetically generated, which means fully controlled, and then you can use them to fast prototype tools, process new services. On the other hand, synthetic data, you can have like a repository of a gold standard data set to assess and certify um, new process that come on board. And finally, if you're able to generate synthetic data, you kind of have some insights on how the data are structured, the real, the real ones. So you could use the synthetic generation process as a mechanism to better understand and have insights on the actual data itself. Okay, so I'll go again to the industry. Antonis, please introduce yourself. This is uh, Antonis Petropoulos from AstraZeneca. Well, uh, it's not a type of uh, expertise here. Uh, I heard previously from Timo that synthetic data is mainly used, at least this has been my understanding, when we are missing or it's, it's, it's difficult to identify or collect some data. Uh, but I voted I do, do not know. But in my mind, all of them, you know, might have a sense of, of truth or sense to, to be right. Okay. Then let's move to another industry representative. Hello, everybody. I'm Asa Kales from Ross Diagnostics, biologist. Actually, there's no consensus among the industry. I don't know either. Uh, what I heard from Timo, actually, uh, <clears throat> trying to educate myself. Uh, Yes, it's a tough, uh, let's say, topic uh, from my knowledge. So, someone who has very strong view was very confident that they are useful apart from the time of the tools and methods. Well, dear, yes. But no. we would like to hear another voice, if you don't mind. So, someone else from the back of the room who voted for fast prototyping. Christine, what did you vote? <laughs> I voted for fast prototyping, uh, <laughs> but but 
Well, yeah. So I'm Christine Kubiak, the operation director of Equin, and uh, so I voted this just because of the of the presentation before, because I'm not an expert, but understanding what uh, was presented, I was thinking that maybe this was um, one one uh, answer. But uh, okay, I, I could have also go for I do not know, but. <laughs> I... Is Christine correct in voting for fast prototyping? In, in other words, is this the top priority in your view? Depends on if we talk about now or the near future. If we talk about now, I would say yes, fast prototyping is um, that what we can do at the moment. But that's not where we see, can see um, synthetic data in the next, let's say, five years. Um, I, I think gold standard, that should be the aim, but that needs still some development. And uh, there was one voice from AstraZeneca. I know uh, they have an own department for synthetic data. So there's a lot of work going on in AstraZeneca. Uh, I'll go to a, to a computer scientist. So please, Theodor. Yeah, uh, Theodor Lamakas from uh, Athena Research Center. Actually, I. Yeah, I voted for the first one, first prototyping of new tools and method because it's the safest <laughs> answer. I, I okay. I, I think this strong dependency with the the domain, okay, and if there are available and um, data for the specific work that you want, for example, to train your your model, etc. Um, I think the third one it might might be interesting, but this is work for the future. I think the idea of using synthetic data sets is somehow to be able to substitute the real ones in case it's very difficult to obtain them. Okay. Um, what did you vote, my co chair? Well, I would go for the last one, basically, the benchmarking. Um, mostly because I fully agree that what we can effectively do now is a fast prototyping. The gold standard data sets are to come, and there are a lot of efforts in sort of preparing these kind of uh, repositories. But ultimately, the use that I see, maybe not in the near future, but like in a midterm, is use them as an automatic way of benchmarking how an activity like we can, can perform, which would be of much significant use because it will accelerate the discovery and, 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 and the research itself. Thank you for this. I thought I was the only one that voted for the last one. So my name is Anastasia Hadzidimitri. I'm the director of the Institute of Applied Biosciences. I didn't get um, the differences between the fast prototyping and benchmarking. I mean, can you explain to us what are the differences exactly? Because I was a little lost. Sure. So, uh, first prototype means that um, assuming that I want to develop a new method, um, I don't have access to the data because they are sensitive. I don't have data period, so I can create a data set um, that simulates my expectations, and then I can go ahead and design my algorithm and have a tool that didn't exist before. Benchmarking is that I have six pipelines. All of them possibly tested, verified, etc. But you need to find out which one runs optimally for a particular set of requirements or expectations. So the benchmarking is sort of doing the assessment of what performs well or not. The final comment. The final comment on synthetic data from our project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question that is rather a question for Timo about the, the, the use of synthetic data for anonymization. For instance, one of the challenges we are facing with uh, the issue of data sharing is how to be able to, to, to send the data to possible reuser as anonymized data set. So this is something interesting in terms of uh, anonymization technique, but uh, I, I, what I understand is that probably uh, the synthetic data conserve the, the mean and the, the, the variance, but not necessarily the correlation. I mean, depending on the use you want to, to make of this data, if you want to reanalyze or perform a meta-analysis from multiple clinical trials, it's something worth it. 
but uh, maybe if you want to use the data set to stratify in the context of a personalized medicine project to stratify the patient and to 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 establish uh, to establish a cluster of homogeneous cluster of patients, maybe it will not work. So this is my question, and this is possibly a limitation of the the use of this technique. Yes, thanks for the question. And that's exactly what I tried to say when I answered that fat drop studies, from my perspective, the current level of usage, and it, we need further research to come to the gold standard. So there are these kind of challenges, of course, exist in case if you ask a question which was not assumed by generating the data, it might mislead you in a total wrong direction. And they, these are, of course, let's say the missing links in these models and, and how to build them. How to how to handle questions which were not uh, covered uh, in the time when the synthetic data were generated, but I, I think it's it's a it's a matter of time and a matter of developing of the process to get here better ways and better data, and then overcome such kind of issues. Now, the final question in this session. Reviewing all the emerging technical models that are used for delivering the digital future in biomedical research, what would be the key requirements? Validation of artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, human interaction, focus on human psychology, or I do not know, and you can start voting now. Okay, Timo, what would you vote if you had the chance? With the majority. With the majority. Thomas? Me too. You too. <laughs> Why? I would say that I have prioritized because all of them are important, but if uh, I have to say which one is the most important, I would say to have validated. You know, so. Okay. Timo, why? We should handle this, um, artificial intelligence in the medical content, same as we handle drugs. And at least in Germany, cybersecurity is so much overheated discussion. I mean, there's no security in the normal world, it's no full security, and we are expecting a full security in, in the digital world. Very nice answer, by the way. Thank you very much for this. Nikos, what did you vote? Please introduce yourself. Um, Nikos, that is with the Greek Patient Association. I voted cybersecurity so that I can send this to the new president of cybersecurity in Greece and make an appointment with him. But of course, uh, I mean, perhaps expanding on this, it's clear that uh, the issues of trust that uh, have been raised uh, uh, need, uh, and you know, um, and particularly in Greece, where we've had a lot of breaches of uh, uh, of data protection. Uh, I think it's an important uh, component, and certainly it would be for society and therefore for patients, which I represent. Thank you. You can it's too fluffy. It's too fluffy. <laughs> no, but I, of course, of course, uh, all of these dimensions and everybody we we partake on all of them. What did you vote, Dr. Kalima? Validation of artificial intelligence. So then we have the clear agreement here, and we would like the final statements from each of you. So you have thirty seconds to give a very strong message. I finished by saying that we we need to train physicians to understand uh, all these complex approaches, and that many physicians confirm my view. So I will stand with that. Timo, your thirty seconds. Thank you very much. Um, we should focus on chances which new technologies gives to us, and not put, put problems too much in focus in the beginning. 